Hi everybody, welcome to Talk Gnosis. This is part two of our conversation with Clark Aitkins about the Gospel of Mary. Jonathan and I pick his brain about the instruction manual that the Gospel of Mary is and what does it instruct people to do. We talk about feminism and its role in both ancient and not modern Gnosticism. And we talk about a practical uh, guide to soul ascent, its relationship to kind of the mystical Judaic and uh, Greek mystery traditions that happened at the time. So, so uh, stick around, you're gonna wanna See this whole episode, part two of Talk Gnosis with Clark Aiken. Okay. Um, and you, uh, you you talk about it as a, as an instruction manual, um, a, a spiritual instruction manual. So what are what is the advice? What are the instructions to 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 work through these powers? To work through the, these <laughs> tell aspects us what to do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> tell us what to do. Yeah. Well, you could. I guess I could sell you copies of my paper. No, True. <laughs> um, <laughs> For a small monetary donation. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay, so interestingly enough, uh, I will start off with um, some of the things that the Savior teaches you how to do to begin your approach. Um, I found it very interesting because as, as we were going through this text in class and, and going through it bit by bit over the weeks and over the months and tearing it apart and dissecting it and everybody's bringing their background to it, mm -hmm. um, I was probably the only person in class that was a bit, uh, openly admitting to, you know, um, having this esoteric background mm -hmm. and being a member of a Gnostic church and all the rest of that. And um, so I was very open in, in trying to read this sort of what I call through es uh, modern esotericist eyes. And near the end before the Savior takes off, um, he tells them to, um, to acquire his peace, to imitate his peace, or as I would uh, insist is like, you know, give birth to the peace of the Savior mm -hmm. coming from inside you. You find that peace, the same peace that the Savior exemplifies, and you bring it out from inside of you. Um, so he says, you know, my peace be unto you, mm -hmm. um, the, the peace that is inside of you. Well, a peace greeting, or in this case, a peace farewell, I suppose, um, is a classic Semitic thing mm -hmm. to find in the text. We, we, we see it in the, in the canon. Um, but um, it's it's not um, specific to the canon, and what I found very interesting was the insistence, the very unique insistence in the Gospel of Mary of bringing it out from inside of you. And I thought that looks like a, a first step. Mm. Acquiring calmness and, and focus is something that most of the modern esotericists that I've ever talked to insist that you have to ha be able to be able to do before you have to have control over your body and your nervous system yeah. before you can do these weird spiritual things. <laughs> That's the first step. You have to be able to focus your mind and you have to be able to get that under control. So when I started thinking about it like that, then the second step made more sense, avoiding external influences. They say, you know, it's in the, the kingdom is in the air, then the birds will have beaten you to it, and if it's in the water, then the fish are already there. Yeah. Um, well, that makes sense because if it's an inner thing and it's a personal thing, then you have to guard those outside influences because you've changed your focus and this is gonna change your focus back out again. This is like what I was saying before about foreground and background. Mm. Um, and then the other two steps are more externally uh, focused about you know, um, uh, going forth and preaching and all of this, but these are, are, are and, oh, and not laying down any more rules. Laying, not laying down any more rule, rules is also, of course, important. It's a way of interacting with the external world as opposed to ignoring it at first, mm -hmm. um, because then you're avoiding being embroiled in political uh, issues and power right. struggles. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last one is preaching, but preaching not for the sake of the world, but preaching because this is what you do and this is who you are. Yeah. Mm. And th those are the spiritual processes. You start with yourself and then you work your way out into the world. This sort of pregnancy metaphor over and over again in the text. Well, we better come back to that while we're on it. Okay. So there is, there is a pregnancy um, you, you see, and then perhaps other scholars as well, you, you do see a very strong pregnancy metaphor, you know, resonating throughout the text, coming up again and again. Could you talk a little bit about that? Right. So, um, of course, uh, the concept of a soul ascent, if you're working your way out through a series of, of realms, uh, obviously pregnancy and giving birth mm -hmm. or growing up out of the ground, um, these are all very common metaphors that would, that, that would, that would apply to it very naturally. Um, and so if you keep thinking of the human, the, the calmness or the, the human one, the, the, this is, which I'm saying is synonymous in the text, we talk about bringing out the human one or bringing out the, the Savior's uh, peace. Um, I think these are the same thing. And they come out from the inside and then you put it on like the true human being. And then as the soul comes out of the body at death or upon leaving for the soul ascent um, and leaves the body behind, 
and moves through these different realms, it's moving out. Mm -hmm. and so it's, con it's a constant birth process of moving from an, a contained to a container and then being contained again and then being the container until you get to the ultimate goal of silent rest. And at first it was just very striking to see that in my mind's eye. But then as we're sitting down and going through the Coptic version of the text um, very slowly, I noticed that one of the verbs in Coptic, which is often easily, easy to translate into English as acquire, to get and bring towards yourself, is also oftentimes interpreted as being to beget or to bear or to give birth to, as we would say modernly. And that is, those ideas don't necessarily go together in English very well, mm -hmm. but they're in the Coptic, and it gets used three, that, that verb kapa gets used three times in the Coptic. Um, but another thing that we've sort of found recently is another verb that uh, in Coptic means to leave behind, to leave barren. It can also mean to destroy. And it is specifically as uh, wanif, I believe I have it written down here. Yeah, uh, no, walsif. And uh, it, it is used twice uh, in the soul, specifically in the soul's interaction with the uh, spirits or with the powers. As he's leaving them behind, as, as the soul defeats the powers or works its way past the powers, it leaves them barren yeah, as it's like moving salts forward. The earth. Say what? It salts the earth? No, no, no. Well, I mean, I, well, maybe, maybe, because a concept of destroying or annulling or leaving is also a part of this verb, and that's usually how it's being translated. But this pregnancy concept is right there in the verb and can't be, I don't think you can really separate it, especially within this text and, the con and all the visuals that are going on with soul ascent and giving birth to, to calmness, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So I don't know about salting the earth, more like leaving, giving birth, like being born, and leaving the womb empty behind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, Father Tony, you actually sort of have a follow-up question here on our question sheet underneath birth imagery, and it's a uh, one word and a question mark. <laughs> so if you want to, this uh, might be thematically connected. If you want to, want to pop that. Sure, it's possible. I mean, so one of the things that um, modern Gnosticism likes to talk about is how. Uh, progressive it was, especially towards women, uh, ancient Gnosticism. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, I don't think it's super easy to read 21st century values back into second yeah, century texts. Um, but this is a story of a woman who is in a, a leadership position. And there are lots of stories in uh, Gnostic, uh, t Gnostic texts specifically that place a very high uh, role upon Mary. Um, would you say that this is um, unusual for the time, and, and what do you think that that means? So yeah, I think mm, unusual. Depends on how you define unusual. <laughs> um, Okay. Spoken like a true scholar. Yeah, right. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially when you study dead that languages. They were a bunch of peace loving feminists. Yeah. Yes, exactly. They well, were. right, because that's what a lot of people want to read into it. Well, okay, so modern feminism, I mean, y you can retroactively project a lot of ideas back into the ancient world, and, and quite effectively so. I mean, I just used a comic book. Yeah. So it's not necessarily wrong in and of itself as long as you're conscious of what you're doing and not, and not insisting that you found the truth. Right. Okay, we can do the same thing as an example with racism, anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. People didn't think in terms of anti-Semitism when Christianity was splitting away from Judaism, but that's exactly the term that we cannot refrain from using when talking about that history. Mm -hmm. So I think that feminism, if we're, if, if we're smart and conscientious of what we're talking about and how we're doing it, we can apply it to this. Um, so if you're talking about in terms of feminism being defined as everybody's equal, men and women are equal, gender and sex and et cetera, et cetera, no matter how you want to define it, biological, social, uh, social constructs or anything, does not make one person morally over another. Mm -hmm. There's no vertical structure. That is in the Gospel of Mary. It absolutely is. And it's part, I, I would say it is, and it's part of the, the discussion that's going on between, you know, uh, uh, Peter yeah. and Mary. Peter's exact gripe specifically is, she's a woman, how can she know all this? How would Jesus dare favor her over us? Yeah. How can she be in charge? How can she have this knowledge and this information? You know, and this gripe comes up also specifically between Peter and Mary and, and the Gospel of Thomas. Yeah. How can she know this? Mm -hmm. and well, the answer is in this idea, in this symbol set, it doesn't matter about your genitalia or about your sexual orientation or any of the rest of those things. W what matters is that you're following this path and following these instructions. 
that's the important thing. So those ideas are there. Mm -hmm. If you want to call them feminism, I don't necessarily have a problem with that. I think it makes sense as long as you're keeping in mind that you are projecting a modern concept and a modern sensibility onto ancient ideas. How common is that? That's a good question. Yeah, that's a good. Uh, that's a question that a lot of people would really like to know the answer sure. to. Mm -hmm. It is fascinating in my mind to see these ideas and how old they really are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, when we're looking at at this text and the community that created it in the wider Christian continuum, uh, you, I you know I honestly do believe that that early Christianity, first and early second century Christianity, does seem to have been quote unquote better for women. Right, and I, you know, I don't want to, in case there's any scholars or Greek neo pagan reconstructionists watching this, but uh, you know, sometimes we have this uh, this idea that Christianity is really bad for women, and you know, everybody was dancing around and equal and loving Zeus, but women were not well done under the Roman Empire. They were they were actually less well off than they were, say, in ancient Greece, right? They couldn't leave the house without a male escort. Uh, they didn't have much agency, where early Christianity did seem to give a lot more agency to to women, and that does seem to perhaps go back to, to the historical Jesus figure. So, I, you know, I could see as, as Christianity starts to, to splinter even more, um, and some factions get a little bit more women negative, that perhaps this text might be picking up on some of these trends that are happening around it in other Christian communities, and being like, whoa, you know, actually women are great. Um, so that's my rant, but there is a question here, Clark. Mm -hmm. Do you see, uh, bring, it, bring it back home, the, uh, so <laughs> do you see a connection between this, this, this feminism, we're using the word in the way that, that you've carefully articulated it, and this birth imagery? Like, are they connecting the two? Are they, are, are they using the birth imagery more because, you know, Mary is the main figure, because this is a text that has a woman leader? Uh, do you know what I'm saying? Like, is this, is this yeah. a more appropriate context to use this birth imagery? Yeah, that's a good question, too. Uh, I can't think of anything in the text that is drawing a specific connection between those two. I don't see a smoking gun in the text, but, I mean, it, it seems pretty obvious that there's something going on there. I mean, mm -hmm. they... Nobody back in that, that day and age would have associated pregnancy and giving birth with anything other than women. That sure. would have been their core, their core job in some <laughs> in some cultures, right? So um, the connection with birth and giving birth. I mean, it, as a spiritual path, yeah. I'm kind of wondering. I mean, do we find can can we define a lot of other spiritual paths prior and at the same time? That, or prior that may have influenced this that can also be seen as being a, a, a feminine or, f or a female process. Um, I know that, I'm, I'm going to get to pronounce this word wrong, Poimandres? Poimandres? Sure. I think uh, it's Poimandres is how I usually I hear yeah, it. Yeah, that's how I usually say it too. I'd have to yeah. sit down and look at it spelled out pro and figure out the pronunciation. But um, it also speaks of the soul ascent as being, I believe the word is regeneration. Mm -hmm. And the gospel, of, or the gospel of John, the canonical gospel of John, of course, talks about being born again. Yeah. So, I mean, this sort of feminine path is in the air. Mm -hmm. the, the gospel of Mary didn't make it up. But I don't think those texts are as woman-friendly or as gender equal, if you want to put it that way, as, as we're talking about with the gospel of Mary. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would like to think there is a connection. Because that that ma makes it all seem very neat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. Is it also that, and this is you know not something I'm super familiar with, but is it also that uh, the 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 gender of the word soul, the gendered noun, is is because it's feminine in a lot of these languages mm -hmm. that that might contribute to the the birth. Um, Analogy, but it's a soul that's being given birth to. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. It's not the soul that's giving mm -hmm. the birth. Yeah, it would sure. be the body that's actually. If, if we're going to talk about death, the, the Platonic and the, all those concepts of, of the the body gives gives up, mm -hmm. gives up the soul as it were, gives up mm -hmm. the ghost. Now I read your paper quickly. Um, mm. and, uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, don't thank me yet. I I didn't get any of it, but uh, you, <laughs> you did talk a little bit about the the gender of. Um, you know the the gender of the body, um, and and uh, containers and and things like that. And I didn't I didn't get any of that. So can you? Okay. Well, it's a sort of a ancient Greek idea of Plato and um, um, uh, some of the other thinkers and some of the other schools of thought. 
um, where the idea would have been that the, the soul is going through a purification process at death, mm -hmm. and therefore giving up the body is the purification of the soul, and it leaves the body. And here is this sort of dualism between you know, spirit and, and, and the material again. Um, and then it ascends up or it goes, where it goes home. It wants to go home, which mm -hmm. is another idea that carries over into the Gospel of Mary. Um, so, I, I mean, yeah, there's that. That's an old idea, actually, at the time. That mm -hmm. would have been a very ancient idea, and everybody would have thought probably something very similar, I think, because it was part of uh, ancient Greek uh, initiatory rituals and stuff like that, or initiatory rites, initiatory religions, I should be saying. Yeah. yeah. Let's talk about that, actually, a little bit, because mm -hmm. that's something that I'm interested in and I don't know enough about. Um, <clears throat> specifically, the traditions that are detailed in the Greek magical papyri, um, I, I know that um, you and I over the years have tossed back and forth that, you know, there's something there that we should be looking into. And I, yeah, I but I haven't I actually haven't looked into All it right, yet. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, well, never mind then. That's I a, said, yeah. for a what's your show? question? Maybe we can figure well, it yeah, out. Or make something up. Yeah, better, let's yeah. totally just... <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what we do. We fill in the lacunae. That's right. Yeah, we fill in the lacunae. Well, I just I see such a similarity between the ascent imagery, and I, I mean this is obviously I think they're all coming from the same kinds of sources. The the, the visionary ascent process that is present in the Greek magical papyri and in the uh, Gnostic texts, mm -hmm. and um, you know share share a common source if not one stems from the other. Mm -hmm. um, it, and I've said this on the show a million times that I believe that this is the most important thing that's missing from contemporary Gnosticism is this kind of soul ascent narrative, as yeah, it were. Yeah, I, I kind of agree, actually. Um, so in thinking about that in terms of what a modern Gnostic does or can do, um, hmm. is are the Gnostic texts enough to if not recreate something like that directly, at least point towards it, or do we have to go th to something like Mithraism or the Greek magical papyri? Well, in good order luck going to Mithraism. Well, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, the, there are, I was thinking specifically about April DeConnick's paper in mm -hmm. that book, you know, that book. Yeah, uh, for <laughs> half a dozen books, yeah. Yeah, and no. And edited text. Yeah, and no, it was, a, it was a collection <laughs> and I'm, Visualizing it, but I can't think of the title. But hers was the first in the. Oh, um, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't read all of that actually. I didn't read. I only read her was, paper. Yeah, she went into detail about some of the. Uh, I believe it was some sort of baptismal initiation. Yes. And the scents and the plants and the symbols that go with them. Right. Right. Yeah. And oh, uh, so you're asking, can we do something like that? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, I yeah. we <laughs> we can, but we. I would say the only. The only problem I have with that is not that we can't do it, but that we'd have to have a, 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 an actual spiritual source for the information that would be specific to us. Yeah, that's my that's, that's where I'm hung up issue. as well. Yeah, and that's not impossible. We just need to do that. Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess we could use good old Uncle Al, <laughs> um, but I, I wouldn't necessarily suggest it all the time. Yeah. yeah um, no, there's a, there's there's a lot of good stuff and and good research that has come out of that tradition, mm -hmm. the, the the Thaliba tradition. For those of you who yeah. uh, don't oh, know Uncle who Uncle Al, Al, Al is, yeah, yeah. Um, but at the same time, it's it's I think they're doing a different thing. No, that's what I, exactly yeah. what I'm saying. That's exactly right. I, 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 it's not that it's bad or it's good. It's just that that's not our thing. Right. We're doing something else, slightly different, closely related, but not the same. Yeah, yeah you, you could make the the analogous point that in some ways it is similar to, to going up the tree and crossing the abyss, right? Say in, in oh, yeah, that's but, interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. I yeah. think, yeah. Not, and I've thought about that too. Um, yeah. it, not that it's, yeah, no, I don't, there's not a one-to-one. -one, I mean, there's not a one-to-one, -one, but they, they probably do come from the same place, right? Uh, possibly. The, uh, well, the, poss the, the, the influence of uh, early Jewish Merkava ascents mysticism and this stuff that's going on, I mean, that was all in the air at the time. Right. So, yeah. But of course, then... And then, I guess it depends on where you draw that dotted line between Merkaba Jewish mysticism, to medieval Kabbalah, to uh, Crowley. To, well, of you course. Know, yeah. I mean, right. we're talking 2,000 years of history, if not yeah. more. So, yeah. I've been, so it's, I mean, it's, there's going to be a lot of gray, murky areas and a lot of underground stuff going on. Um, but and I, I, oh, sorry, I'm sure I don't think they're the same thing, but I, I do yeah. think they're analogous. And yeah, yeah that, what I find interesting in the Merkaba too is that they, um, which I don't know that much about. We need to do a show on it. But you are <laughs> find it very interesting. You're challenged by the angels. Mm -hmm. They're usually angels, right? So and then it's like, yeah. the, I find that challenge aspect that, which is I think 
kind of stronger in Gnosticism and um, Gnosticism and uh, in Merkaba than in other traditions where they do talk about it as being an ordeal or a challenge or a shamanic thing, but there isn't that quite that entity being like, you got to say this, you got to give it to me, you got to tell me why I should right. let you pass. That is, I, I think that comes out of Egypt. Um, yeah. And specifically, that challenge the, and, and yeah, that well, okay, that's possible. Um, I don't know enough about ancient Egyptian religions, so I can't say yes or no. But what I do know is that in the ancient Greek religion, uh, the religious uh, systems, um, this, the challenge and pass system can be traced back to uh, the Orphic golden tab tab tablets or the Bacchic golden tablets. Mm. Um, and so, okay, the ancient Greek afterlife for quite a long time was a very grim place mm -hmm. where you were suspended upside down in mountains of poo and got to roll uh, boulders up and down a hill because that's what you love to do and you were, it was a place of forgetfulness. Unless, of course, you were initiated in, at Eleusis, and then you got to celebrate the rites for eternity. You got to celebrate Ele you know, Eleusinian rites forever. You got to eat, and you got to remember, and you got to sing and dance and parade, just like you did at the initiation, apparently. Um, well, so that's the first sign, I think, uh, from my understanding, my very limited exploration in this angle, um, of where there's a hint in this part of the world where the afterlife, where, where who you are and what you did as a living person, you're conscious of it in the afterlife to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. The next hint comes with uh, the, uh, the Orphics, who are, who are uh, some would argue, are, are a school of, of the Bakoi. Uh, this, this distinction, I don't know it well enough yet. Um, and I think that there's some debate going on about it, about that distinction. Um, but we do know that after all uses and uh, became a big thing, and there were basically door-to-door -door initiators going on. I mean, just think mm. about this, like Tupperware salesmen. <laughs> and they're going and they're going door to door, it's, it seems, and initiating people, making them worried about who they were going what was going to happen in the afterlife. Mm. And then uh, it would seem that they have had rights. And they did the initiation, and then when you had the initiation, then you were good to go. The initiation, the ritual itself was enough to create a difference in who you were after death. Whether you felt it or not, whether it manifested in, you know, your your economic life or not but it had some sort of an effect on who you were and mm. on your soul and, and what would happen after the body went away. Well, a lot of these folks who were initiated were buried with these golden tablets, these little inscribed golden leaves that were folded up and were probably mnemonic devices. Mm. And this mnemonic device, one of the first challenges where we find, I think, from what I understand, the first challenge and password type situation where you are given instructions to turn, oh, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, it's been so long since I looked at it, right or left around Persephone's mansion, Pluto oh, okay. Persephone's mansion. And so. you take, you don't take this path, you take the other path and you're going to come to this tree and this guy's gonna step out from behind the tree and he's gonna challenge you and you have to say, mm, yeah. I am a child of earth and starry heaven and my race is of heaven. Yeah. Or, or a child of earth and starry sky. Mm -hmm. And then he lets you pass. We don't know where you go. Mm. There are some hints because before heroes could pass by and go to a land of an eternal, an, I think an island of an eternal life where you got the hero for the rest of eternity, if that sounds like a good thing to you. <laughs> um, we don't know what kind of eternity uh, these Orphic initiates lived. It's, it's another show we got to do mm -hmm. because uh, the other, the other, uh, our, our other favorite Gnostic uh, podcast, uh, Miguel Connors, uh, Aeon Bite, he's, he's quite um, fond of of mentioning, uh, though he, I don't know how much he's gone into it, that, you know, uh, about kind of Orphism being a, a, a precursor to Gnosticism, either a pre-Christian Gnosticism or if not a pre-Christian Gnosticism, then a major influence on later Christian Gnosticism. And, you know, in Orphism you can also see that, that there is ideas kind of similar that you would find in the NHL about, uh, you know, the, the, the soul being bound by negative deities to the earth. But that's another show. Mm, that's uh, interesting. I will There's also I will the notion of remembrance uh, after yes. you die. The whole point, uh, part of the point is you have, I, I just remember this, yeah. Before, uh, prior to the Orphic process, there was forgetting in the afterlife, but part of the initiation was to help you remember who you were. Not just that you were carrying a mnemonic device, but I think that, if I remember correctly, there are waters of remembrance, mm. I think. I have to look at this again. I'm reminded, and I'm just riffing now, but I'm reminded of the, um, the Hymn of the Pearl, where the, mm. uh, oh, yeah, yeah, where the soul descends and then eats and drinks and forgets. Mm -hmm. And then the, mm -hmm. the job of the, 
the redeemer figure in that instance, a flapping scroll of right. flying flapping scroll, uh, comes down and, and reminds, right. uh, you know, ha assists in that remembering. Well, that's it for part two of three of this conversation with Clark Aitkins. I hope you enjoyed it. Coming up on in part three, we're going to talk about the nature of sin and the passions in the Gospel of Mary. We're also going to talk about the relationship between the Greek philosophers and the early Christians. We're going to see what they thought about the early Christians. That's a very interesting idea. We're also going to talk about some modern applications of the Gospel of Mary and how we can put it into use uh, today for, uh, for our own spiritual practices. So you're going to want to subscribe to us either on YouTube or at GnosticWisdom.net for the video or podcast versions respectively. We're trying this new format. It's very interesting. So uh, make sure that you go and you subscribe to us in one or both of those places if you haven't already. And if you found this content valuable and interesting, please do give us some support on Patreon.com slash Gnostic. You give a small pledge and uh, at the end of the month your, your card gets charged for every piece of content we put out. And uh, your support will help us grow the network and make new and exciting shows for you and, and uh, more, uh, more, t more guests and more topics. So if you like us and you want to support us, that's how you do it. Thank you so much for everybody who has already. So stick around for part three, the, the final part of this conversation with Clark Aitkins about the Gospel of Mary, and we'll see you next week.